Good morning again, everybody. So today we're going to be talking about the power of stories to teach us. The power that stories have to show us things that we hadn't seen before. If we think about a simple story that we might tell our children, we think of the story of the boy who cried wolf. The boy who's up on the mountain looking after sheep, he gets bored, so he cries out, wolf, wolf. And the whole village comes rushing up the hill to try and chase away the, the wolf to find nothing. And the boy just thinks, it's funny. Later again, the boy being bored cries out, wolf, wolf, the village again rushes up the hill to find nothing. The boy again thinks it's funny. The third time though, the boy actually sees a wolf circling around his sheep and he cries out, wolf, wolf, and nobody comes. So the boy, without any sheep, goes back to the town and says to, the, to, says to everybody, where were you? I cried, wolf, wolf. And the wise man of the town says, we don't believe liars, even when they're telling the truth. And that's a simple story that we all know. But it has the power to give us a reflection of something that we hadn't thought about before. It allows us to see something that we hadn't perhaps comprehended before. The stories of the Lord's Word are exactly the same. Well, even better. Because they're not just teaching us about life principles, they're teaching us also about heavenly principles. And so these stories that the Lord gives us in His sacred scriptures are even more important than the stories that we get in any storybook because of the level in which those stories can help us reflect on our life. In the Christmas story, this Christmas story starts off with John the Baptist. We see Zacharias in the temple and the Lord appearing to him, telling him that his wife of a very old age will bear a child. And so that's the start of the story of Christmas with the birth of John and then the birth of Jesus. And we see later in the ministry of Jesus, John the Baptist coming to preach and baptize and prepare the way for the Lord. And so in the Christmas story, leading the way is always John the Baptist. And there's an important reason for including the story of John the Baptist into the Christmas story. Because the Christmas story itself is about the Lord's birth, the Lord's coming into not just the world, but the Lord's birth into each one of our lives whenever a new love is born within our hearts and minds. But before that new love can be born in our hearts and minds, we have to be prepared, a way has to be prepared. And so there is always a John the Baptist within our lives before a new love is born into our hearts and minds. So what is the state of our lives where we need this preparation work done before receiving the Lord? What is it that the Lord is trying to teach us through the story of John? Well, let's think about what the Lord desires for us. What is his end in view? The Lord's end in view for us is that we are able to live a life in this world where we are constantly in a state of joy and happiness. It's a state of life that we perhaps won't reach in this world, but that's the promise for us definitely in heaven. But that ultimately is the desire for the Lord for our lives, that we can live in a state of joy and happiness and peace and comfort in this world. But so often in our lives we have moments of joy and peace and comfort, and then the things of the world steal away that joy, steal away that happiness, steal away that peace. And so we only get to experience short moments in life where we are at peace, where we feel loved, where we feel cared for. And the rest of it is filled up with a lot of mundane stuff, 
some hurtful stuff, some self-centered stuff, all mixed in into that life that steals away the joy of heaven in our lives. So the story of John the Baptist is a story about how the Lord is preparing us for that state. How the Lord prepares us to be in a state of joy and peace and happiness. So what is happening within us that we need the John and that stops us from reaching this place of joy and happiness constantly? I want to read to you from Isaiah 60. It says, Arise, shine, for, your, for the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Sorry, arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. So here in this verse we see the glory of the Lord, the light that shines, the Lord always present with us, always wanting what is good for us, but the people, us, we are in darkness. The earth is in darkness. And so this describes the Lord's vision for us, but also the state that we find ourselves in. And so how do we move from the state of darkness that the Lord is talking about into the state of light? The state of being in, a, in hurt or pain or frustration or anger into a place of comfort and joy and peace. What is that preparation that needs to happen in our lives? Maybe you know, but maybe you don't, but the chancel, the chancel has been laid out to represent our minds. At the center and at the highest level is a circle that represents our heavenly minds, right? The, the highest part of our minds. This level, the spiritual part of our minds. And it's this area of our minds that allows us to receive the Lord, to receive His light, to receive His wisdom, to receive His love. It flows in to our celestial and spiritual mind, our heavenly and spiritual mind. But that's not where we spend our lives. We don't spend our lives here. And the camera might have to zoom back for this. We spend our lives here. This is the last step. This is the outermost part of our life. This is where we engage in the work that we do in family life and all the things going out to the shops, driving in the car, our general interaction with people. And in the mix of these things, there is anger and frustration and uh, trying to do our best and, and feeling like we're a failure and all sorts of feelings are part of this area of our life. It's the general experience of our life. And when we are in the state, it is as if there is darkness behind us. We can't see the light of the Lord behind us. We're standing here and behind us is darkness and it's the, the fears and the frustration, and the anger, and the criticism, and judgment that darken the, the way behind us, that darken the light that comes from the Lord. And so we need a pathway, a pathway that helps to break through this darkness so that we can again receive the light from the Lord. And that preparing of the way is the story of John the Baptist. How we get from being down there in our, natural, in our natural lives, in our outermost mind, interacting in the world, and how does the Lord lead us up so that we can come to His light, come to His shining? And that is through John the Baptist. John the Baptist is an image, is a picture of the Lord's Word and those stories in His Word. I want to read to you, we read part of the Matthew 3 for the kids. I want to read the remaining bit. It describes 
John the Baptist. It says, Now John himself was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. So if we picture John, he's not, it's not a very handsome picture. It's not a very refined picture. It's a very rough picture of John. Right? Camel's hair, leather, locusts and wild honey. But that's the Lord's word. That's the, the appearance of the Lord's word from a, from a spiritual perspective. It appears unrefined. It appears a little rough. But nevertheless, there is nourishment. There is food there. The locust represents the way that the Lord's word nourishes us anyway. Even in its roughness, there's food for us. And the honey represents the delight that is still there in those stories. If we think about your favorite uh, story in the Bible, for me, my favorite stories are Daniel in the lion's den. A story about the Lord always present, always protecting. It's a rough idea, but it's a general idea, but it's there in that story. And the affection, the, the love for that story, the, the honey that's there for us, enjoying the story, especially as, as a young boy. Another one for me is the story of, da of David and Goliath. How the Lord is always there protecting and helping you fight against the things in your life that are evil. Again, there is food there. In those general uh, idea within that story there is food and there is an affection there is a desire to know and to hold that story in our minds so John the Baptist represents all the stories all the stories in the word a little bit rough general ideas but stories that we can love nevertheless we are drawn to them perhaps yours is the Christmas story so with every story with every story, there is an opportunity to turn our minds to new things. With every story, there is an opportunity to teach us something that we hadn't seen before, that we hadn't thought about before. Every story in the Lord's Word is there to help draw our minds away from the things of this world and turn our minds towards what is of the Lord's. So I want to read to you from the book Secrets of Heaven. You can follow along in your pew card. We start with number 5165. It says, For within the sensory impressions present in our exterior mind. So that's this bottom step. In the sensory impressions, when we read the word, when we... Uh, enjoy those stories. Right? They, they're imprinted on our memory. They're imprinted on our outermost mind. So for within the sensory impressions present in the exterior natural mind, we can see interior things. Right? That idea that every story holds within it a, a, an idea, a, a spiritual idea or, or a moral idea or a heavenly idea Within that story, every story teaches us something about something that's interior to it. In much the same way as he sees people's affections within their faces and even more interior affections within their eyes. So if we look at a person's face, we might see their face, but we actually look th through their face or past their face, as it were, and we also see a person's emotions. How do, they, how do they look today? Do they look happy? Do they look sad? Right? And so a face isn't just a blank thing, but it allows us to peer through that to something that is deeper. So without that interior face or mirror, such as this, is, uh, such as this no one is able, while living in the body, to engage in any thought at all above things that, about things that are above the senses. When we read the stories from the Lord's Word and we hold them in our minds, 
those, each one of those stories has the ability to show us something more deeply. And that story then is able, we're able to look at that story and reflect back on our own lives. It's like a mirror. I'm seeing the story, but I'm also seeing a deeper side of that story. I'm able to see myself in that story. I'm able to see how it, I might be acting like that. I put myself into the story. Without that, without the story, to hold that inner idea, we wouldn't be able to reflect on deeper things in our minds. It may be likened, if we continue reading, it may be likened to someone listening to another speaking. He pays no attention to the words the speaker uses, but only to the meaning of which is uttered by him. Right? The outermost things are a carrier, but we're listening, we're looking for those things that are more interior to that. The actual words that are used are like a mirror in which the inner meaning can be seen. The same is so with the exterior natural part of our minds. If this did not serve the interior things as a mirror in which they see themselves as if in a mirror, a person could not engage in any thought at all. So here we see the importance of every story in the Lord's Word. Every story carries with it a message. So the story is there, but the Lord gives us the message that enables us to reflect on our lives. But that's half of the equation. The other half is the, the wild honey side of it, the affection side of the story when it comes to preparing a way. We read from Secrets of Heaven, number 3089. With anyone who is being regenerated or reborn or recreated, his, inner, his initial affection or love for truth is largely impure. It holds within it the desire to satisfy a purpose and an end that have himself in view, the world, glory in heaven, and similar things which regard himself and not the common good, the Lord's kingdom, still less the Lord himself. So when we are in our state of mind that is exterior, we have the Lord's word, we have those stories, but we also have our own selfish desires, our own selfish loves. When we hear about heaven, when we hear about peace, when we hear about comfort, we desire that. We all want to be in heaven. Right? I don't think there's anybody here who doesn't want to experience the joy and the happiness and the peace and the comfort of heaven. And we want that for ourselves. We want it for selfish reasons. But before you beat yourself up, the Lord says this, such affections inevitably come first. Those affections must come first. They will come first. Nevertheless, the Lord purifies it gradually so that at length falsities and evils are removed and banished, so to speak, to the circumference. But they have nevertheless served as a means. So the Lord is trying to lead us from the outermost part of our lives up and inwards to the inmost part of our minds. From the outermost part that is then covered with darkness, the Lord wants to make a pathway that leads in. And it has to start in the outermost part. The Lord cannot break through the darkness, then he would be taking away our freedom. So the Lord gives us his word. He gives us his stories. And he gives us a selfish desire for heaven. But that's the beginning of the pathway. That's the pathway that breaks through that darkness. That's the way, the way the Lord leads us to think more clearly, to think more spiritually, and over time purify our hearts so that we love more deeply. So this Christmas, I want to encourage you for your children, 
to read the Christmas stories. Read other stories in the Word that, that you enjoy. That's an important part of preparing the way. If you read the Christmas stories for yourself, try read them this year with a newness of mind. Try read them in a way where you're not preempting the story, where you're try, not trying to remember the story, but just reading the story and taking it in in that moment. What are new things that you can discover? What are new feelings that you might feel about the story? The stories are the pathway, are part of the pathway to inner things. So allow yourself, allow yourself to enjoy those stories. Enjoy the stories and imagine yourself as part of them. Think of the angels and the glory and the praise at the Lord's birth. Think of the shepherds and their fear, which then turns into an excitement to go and discover and then a wonder at the Lord's birth. Think about the wise men, wealthy, wise, and yet humbling themselves before the Lord respecting and honoring him and recognizing that this is God here on earth. The stories of the Lord's word are a powerful means that allow us to move out of the general life that we live, out of the humdrum of life, and open us up to heavenly things, to create that path through the darkness so that the Lord's light can begin to shine into our lives with the idea that this is just a pathway that is ultimately going to bring the Lord's new life and new love into your life. So I want to end with that quote from Matthew 3. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Amen.